Stock markets survived U.S. CPI data. That's the abiding sense uh, after the much-anticipated number came out, but they certainly did not cheer it as they did the preceding producer uh, price index a day earlier. And so we are left scratching our heads saying, well, now what? This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And we're going to try to answer that question here uh, as uh, we look at not only uh, what happened with the CPI data, but also uh, some other important bits of the global puzzle here overnight. Look at what's coming up next and then consider what it all might mean going forward. Uh, because what it seems like we are looking at here is perhaps a story that, well, while it didn't enable the markets to have a moment of crescendo, as it were, uh, with the uh, appearance of uh, the CPI e economic data, it does appear to set up a situation where we do have to ask ourselves, is now the reason to worry? Are we looking at a situation uh, here where there is a genuine concern that's building in the markets even as the sort of overall near-term dynamics uh, that we find ourselves looking at today sort of end up with a kind of stalling and a kind of um, inconclusive sense. So with that in mind, let's first take a look at the s and here, and that sort of uh, lack of conviction seems uh, re uh, readily apparent. So yesterday we were looking at this kind of um, zone here, the underside of the range on the S&P, which, of course, we're using here as an avatar for overall risk sentiment, and the gap that was made with that August 2nd jobs report that gave us the breakdown through the bounds of the up move uh, from the lows in late October, early November, essentially overturning this whole thing. Obviously, that had quite the crescendo on August the 5th uh, last Monday. We've seen uh, since corrected, and now we're back to the point where the breakout occurred Notably, on the uh, basis of this CPI number, we went nowhere. So we've corrected into this area. The PPI number yesterday helped. We'll touch on that uh, here in, in just a moment. But, of course, we discussed it in detail yesterday on the show. Uh, but the CPI number gives us very little to look at. No conviction to keep going higher, even as we get uh, limited uh, downside momentum. So let's consider here what actually came out and what it means. Here's the CPI report, and the core came in uh, to 3.2% from 33 as expected. Uh, the headline, depending on which aggregate you looked at, was either a forecast of 2.9 or of 3. It fell on the lower end of that spectrum uh, at 2.9, but was generally in line with expectations, uh, give or take. No big uh, shockers here. And in fact, the Cleveland Fed model uh, of, of CPI, which was calling for slightly higher numbers, was again hotter than um, the realized results, much like what we saw uh, really since April's report. So perhaps to some extent it makes sense that the markets did not have an emphatic response, this was basically in line with what investors had anticipated. And so the numbers themselves were generally baked into the market, almost certainly, when this came out. And so there wasn't really a immediate intraday uh, impetus to do one thing or another with particular conviction. 
But looking at the internals of this report, what we see is increasingly significant disinflation pretty much across every category. So where you do not have dramatic disinflation, you don't have much change. So in this um, education and communication component, for example, there's a bit of a, a pickup in year-on-year -year inflation over the past three months, but this is a tiny contributor, and the inflation here is less than 1%, so it's quite modest. Recreation is basically stalling rather than actively disinflating. The uh, medical uh, care uh, component is relatively steady, but a lot of the really big sources of sticky inflation here previously, shelter most significantly, it coming in, used cars, actually negative disinflation across the big uh, categories and, of course, most importantly, the core. So the general structure of the data, speaking to ebbing upward pressure on prices, and, of course, that rhymes with a sense that we got from the PPI report yesterday that there is some level of ebbing consumer demand that seems to be behind the disinflation at this point. Uh, yesterday, the PPI report um, was pointedly showing us that we have a situation where all of the disinflation that the numbers had seemed to come from shrinking margins for wholesalers, which is uh, to say a lot of the inflation was input costs mainly from oil that then could not be passed on to consumers. And so wholesalers had to eat it. That's one of those uh, indicators that might imply that the reason they weren't passed on to consumers because is because wholesalers didn't think consumers would absorb it and would instead cut back on consumption. And that, of course, doesn't speak positively to levels of demand in what is the largest single engine of U.S. economic growth, household consumption. Fast forward to this data, and as you see the broadening of disinflation across all of these spending categories, you get some confirmation that indeed the consumer is operating with a weaker hand here. On top of this data, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand cut rates overnight forecast a recession for the second half of the year and slashed inflation expectations from an average of about 3.5-4% in the first half of the year to 2.3% in the second half, adding to the sort of global chorus of concern around growth. They were not expected to cut this time, uh, nor uh, was the market really uh, preparing itself for this kind of a sharp about face in forecasts. And so uh, the the New Zealand dollar fell by close to 1%. But for the broader markets, the implication here is yet another G10 central bank after rate cuts in Europe, after uh, rate cuts in Canada, has gotten cold feet about growth and about the global business cycle. It was a similar story with UK CPI data. You'll notice uh, here an interesting disparity. The headline inflation rate right here uh, actually falling month over month. The year-on-year -year number coming up a bit from uh, 2%, less so than expected. But when we look at the core the core actually moves lower from 3.5 to 3.3 percent. And so, again, you get this sense that there is a kind of letting out of air in consumption dynamics. And, of course, with uh, the U.K. as with the U.S., consumption is the main engine 
of output growth. So yet another tidbit, yet another bit in this pile of gathering international news pointing to a global slowdown. Data out of China, likewise uh, discouraging, that economy, of course, has been on the ropes really all uh, all of uh, the period since they came out of uh, COVID lockdowns, and needless to say, very much so before they came out of those lockdowns. And one of the main stories has been the sort of lackluster stimulus effort being made to uplift the economy, which, of course, uh, as the world's second largest, is a big uh, component in any global slowdown story. And what we saw here was that new loans underwhelmed. Uh, the expectation was that we'd get uh, 450 billion yuan. We got 260 billion instead. So some amount of um, of a pullback from the uh, June numbers, where we, we got 2.13 trillion. That was expected, but not this much. And as a matter of fact, if we look at what this amounts to, this was the smallest increase in in new loans on a monthly basis for China since October of 2009. So if hopes for a rebound in China were going to uplift this otherwise negative global growth story, it's unclear how that's going to happen when not only are we not getting uh, organic growth really building, but the stimulus effort to try to jumpstart things is very clearly lackluster. On top of all of that, uh, just uh, earlier this week, economic sentiment in the Eurozone, the other major uh, source of global demand between the U.S. and China, this is the third large engine, sharply lower, unexpectedly so. And of course, uh, the German uh, numbers that came alongside likewise negative. Again, adding into this pile of gathering negativity. So where do we go next? Stock markets uh, clearly had uh, a nice pop yesterday. They didn't quite know what to make of CPI, but the atmospherics here still seem to be feeding the very same growth concerns that emerged in early July and indeed have given us this whole decline. If we recall, this occurred as the Fed began to say, we are now about as concerned about a rise in unemployment as we are a rise in inflation. That's, of course, exactly what's made rate cuts appear imminent. September is now fully expected uh, to see a cut. The debate is really more about, will it be a 50 basis point cut or a 25 basis point cut? And in the wake of these lower C PI numbers uh, and uh, these growth concerns, despite the fact that we've had a rebound in stocks here, the likelihood of a 50 basis point, which one might consider a, a, a kind of emergency-minded size of a cut, they've only just, a, just come in and only somewhat. We're still looking at about a 50-50 shot of a 50 basis point cut in September. So it's clearly a level of growth concern that has been permeating in markets since early July. And the most recent data, CPI included, don't exactly allay it. Rather, they point in the opposite direction. Then there is what comes next. First, UK GDP data, uh, expectations are for a 0.6% increase quarter on quarter. That would be uh, a slight down step from 0.7% in the first quarter. But nevertheless, it would give uh, the UK the best uh, six-month run since essentially back here. The, uh, l uh, the fourth quarter of 2021 and the first quarter of 2022. Nevertheless, if we look at the way that UK economic data has been performing relative to forecasts, we can see it's gotten a bit soggy lately. And so there is this risk of 
a downside surprise because, of course, if data is underperforming relative to expectations, this is the Citigroup e e uh, economic surprise index here, well, then that suggests that economists' models are set up rosier than reality is endorsing. And for as long as that persists, we, of course, continue to have downside surprise risk as these numbers come out. Next, we have U.S. retail sales data. Here, we're looking for a 0.3% rise month over month after a flat result in June. And again, here, the surprise index uh, is telling us U.S. US economic data has increasingly uh, disappointed relative to forecasts. And in this case, we're actually under this zero line, which means that the news flow actually now tends toward disappointment, whereas in the case of the UK, we're seeing the margin of outperformance wane rather than outright looking for a disappointing number. But all of this fits in the narrative. Here is the global surprise index. This is uh, all of the economies that Citigroup uh, looks at. This is a reflection of emerging markets, uh, ma uh, major markets alike. And what we see is since about the beginning of April, there has been a steady and consistent deterioration in global data outcomes relative to expectations. And here at the global level, we are very much below zero. As a matter of fact, the dynamics here are telling us that data is underperforming by the biggest margin in over two years, at the very least. That's as far back as this uh, particular uh, data source goes. So we very clearly are looking here at a world that is not endorsing the positivity that analysts' models have baked in. And that, of course, sets the stage for a larger re, uh, re rebalancing of portfolios, if you will, a repositioning for a worldview that sort of resets the lens that would have us underperform to this extent. And, of course, that means that the tuning of that lens has to go in the direction of a slower, more defensive economic environment. As a matter of fact, looking at uh, the global purchasing manager index numbers, PMI numbers from S&P uh, Global, we can see that for two months already, global manufacturing and service sector growth has been slowing. Now, uh, for the manufacturing sector, we're back under the 50 line, so that is actually contracting now as of the latest numbers. Services are still growing. They're still ab above that 50 boom-bust line. But for two months now, things are decelerating. And if this continues, well, then this is likely to continue low. On top of all this, there is perhaps one spot of somewhat brighter growth dynamics. But alas it comes in Japan. We are also going to get second quarter uh, Japanese GDP numbers here, and they are expected to give us a bit of an increase, a rise to 2.1% annualized growth from a contraction of 1.8% in the prior month. Now, this is very much within sort of the range of normal for, for uh, the oscillation in the annualized growth rate for post-pandemic Japan, but if this, in fact, registers as anything that's somewhat positive, even if this, too, falls into the sort of global dynamic of disappointing outcomes, although Japan has kind of bucked that uh, dynamic recently, if this does tend to come out relatively positive, and we should note there is a bit of positive seasonality to the second quarter in Japan, that's the start of the Japanese fiscal year on April the 1st, and there's some level of seasonality to new outlays being allocated in the second quarter, and so that can be a, a bit of a upside bias uh, 
on that three month period GDP number. So there is a bit of a grain of salt in over interpreting any kind of strength. It could be a, a seasonal thing that then fades. But nevertheless, the Bank of Japan is the only central bank that's not cutting and is in fact looking to hike. We got news overnight that Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will not seek re-election, and he's been much more dovish than uh, the Bank of Japan and sort of fighting this idea that they need to normalize interest rates uh, to some sort of a higher level, that he won't seek re-election seems to have paved the way for friendlier leadership going forward where whoever is next is more so of the BOJ view that raising rates to boost the yen and thereby to boost purchasing power of imported mainly food and energy, but of course all things for Japanese consumers should be what the central bank is doing and should be a, a policy objective more uh, more widely. So if that's the case, well, then we are back into a story, much as we were on uh, Monday last week when so much focus fell on Japan as its markets were reeling from soft U.S. economic data, to say, well, if there's a global slowdown everywhere and already a level of impetus to sell risky assets, including those funded by borrowing cheaply in the yen, the carry strategy that all of a sudden everybody is discussing far and wide after uh, last Friday's or uh, and and uh, Monday's fireworks, I should say, last Monday and the preceding uh, Friday, the impetus for all of that. Um, now that everybody's looking at it. We get a relatively strong Japanese GDP number that then says the Bank of Japan is going to have clearance to keep raising rates and encourage the unwinding of carry at the same time that you get these growth concerns, maybe with a miss on UK GDP, maybe with a miss on US retail sales, and suddenly Monday's dynamic comes back into the fore. We have growth concerns initiating lower risky assets, initiating selling, including of uh, bets that are funded in the yen, at the same time that Japan's own central bank is adding to the amplifying effect and saying, we're going to be able to raise rates more and have the clearance to, uh, to do it which then becomes a liquidation that runs the risk of feeding on itself, much like Monday's episode last week did. And so the overall story here seems increasingly raising a red flag about what happens at this juncture next, where if you hold here now in the wake of CPI, and over the coming day or two, you roll back lower, what you might be looking at is not so much a digestion or a pullback, but the resumption of a down move from early July, which perhaps then marks the next leg in what is a downtrend that's just getting started. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here every Monday through Thursday, right after show, uh, Overtime, a show that I co-host with Chris Vecchio and Dylan Radigan, looking at the Wall Street close. I am on uh, with Victor Jones on Wednesdays for The Price of Truth. I am on with Chris again for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, on with Victor and Tom for First Call on Sundays writing for the news and insights portion of tastylive.com and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter at alias Thanks very much for watching. Macro Money is back tomorrow.